IV piggyback would be just setting up an IV line. You've got your primary line going through your drop set. Maybe it's normal saline, something like that. And piggyback is just setting up another IV line that connects into one of those ports and has a separate IV bag. Maybe you've got some uh, sort of medication mixed in a fluid. That's all it means, just setting up a second one to piggyback its way in along with your regular primary line. Sometimes you might have four or five medications, four or five different lines set up piggyback, depending on the patient and what their needs are. IV pumps are great. They give you very accurate amounts. They can also do a lot of your calculations for you. You can type in there, depending on what pump you have, you can type in there what your drug is, what your concentration, how much you want to give, what your desired dose, and it does all the math for you. It's awesome takes out all that human error factor that we talk about. You're in those stressful situations. That way you don't have to think and do as much of that math. They're all different though. So just be familiar with whatever your service has. Uh, a big issue with those can be air trapping. And so what that means is maybe there's just a real small air bubble in that tubing. It can throw an alarm on the pump. Some pumps are pretty good at just passing that through and some will just immediately alarm at you, depending on what brand of pump you have on there. There's a couple different choices there. That one on the bottom left is nice. It's very compact and gives you three different channels there, but it won't do a ton of the math for you. Uh, the one on the right there looks like it's only a single channel. I'm not real familiar with it, but get familiar with whatever you have there at your service and how to use it and how to let it help you with all your calculations and stuff too. <clears throat> you may have multiple chambers for multiple medications. You might have extra channels you can add to it or it might be built with like that three channel system. So you could do that too. IO medications. Just know fluid does not flow well into the bone. It is like I mentioned before, painful, so you want to start with some, if someone's conscious and you're having to give them an IO, you want to start with some lidocaine or something to numb up that bone. If you're giving fluids through it, you might have to have a pressure bag for that. Or something I have found, uh, especially with your cardiac arrest, is whenever you go to flush that IO initially, if you flush it rather forcefully, it seems to flow better after that. The fluids will flow better after that initial forceful flush. Percutaneous is another way you can give medications. Medications are applied to and or absorbed through the skin and mucous membrane. Transdermal medication administration. You get maybe some nitro paste that somebody puts on their chest as at the hospital and then you're taking on a transfer. They might have that nitro paste on there. It's a long term. It's just absorbed through the skin. Uh, fentanyl patches or pain patches, nicotine patches, all that stuff is all going to be transdermal coming through there. If you're going to use it, of course, check your tin rights. Sublingual is another percutaneous way. Squirt some nitro underneath their tongue. Highly vascular, rapidly absorbed. Might not taste real well, but if you're going underneath the tongue, there's not as many. Not really. Taste buds underneath the tongue. Buccal would be putting it between the cheek and the gum. So if someone has a dip in or you know, nicotine pouch or something, it would be between the cheek and the gum. It's buccal, being absorbed buccally. It could be a tablet or gel also that you give that way. Same thing. Check your tin rights. Make sure you're wearing gloves if you have to give it there. Yeah, if you want it to be buccal or sublingual, make sure that you tell the patient what you're doing and what they need to do and just let the tablet dissolve or just let it sit there. Don't chew it up. Don't swallow it. Anything. Make sure you're educating your patient about it all. Ocular, you can give eye drops if you need to. Just another way of giving it. Confirm the prescription. Have them tilt their head and look up, expose the conjunctiva, conjunctiva, and administer it, and then have them close their eyes for a couple minutes 
help it absorb there. Ear canal, another way to give medication. Have them lay with the affected ear facing up. So you pull back on the ear lobe so you can expose that ear canal a little bit and administer your medication. Intranasal is a popular way of giving it. Nice thing about intranasal is it goes back to that needleless system. If somebody is seizing, they need a benzodiazepine, Merced, Valium, something like that, soft seizure. You don't really want to go at them with a needle because they're seizing and shaking around, so a safer way to do that would be intranasally. Just squirt it up the nose, try to choose whichever nose it is larger, and squirt it up there. You might have to give a larger dose, depending on your protocol, uh, but just keep that in mind. Narcan is obviously very popular right now for giving that intranasally, and you give a much higher dose with that if you're doing it. Ideally, if possible, if the patient's able to, you need to give something up the nose. Maybe you're just giving pain control, fentanyl or ketamine or something like that. Before you move the patient, you want to give them something up the nose. Have them breathe in. Take, take a deep breath whenever you go to squirt that up their nose. That way it can get in their airway and down their lungs and be absorbed a little bit faster. Inhalation, nebulizers, meter dose inhalers, uh, just another way of doing it. If you're going to use one of those, get familiar with what you have on your ambulance or at your service. Or if you're going to use one like in the pictures here where the, it looks like the parent is administering that to the kid, don't be afraid to ask him, hey, how do you do this? What's the best way? And uh, use the, all your resources there to help you. Make sure it's giving an effective dose. That's another nebulizer here. You can also set up your nebulizer, like that bottom picture between your BVM and that face mask. So you can get a breathing treatment and you can bag them at the same time. Play with it all. We'll use it all in class. You'll get familiar with it all. Uh, there you go. If patient, if you need to do an inhaler or a nebulizer and they're BVM system with the BVM attach the nebulizer to the device between the two and you can do the same thing for CPAP a lot of times. You might just need to find a little different fitting adapter so it all fits together nicely. Endotracheal we don't really do that anymore since IOs have become so popular and they're so easy to do we don't really need to put anything down the tube. If you had to do something down the tube, remember the mnemonic LEAN, L-E-A-N, lidocaine, epi, atropine, narcan. But since IOs are nice, we don't really have to do that anymore. Long-term vac vascular access devices, you'll run into these quite a bit. Uh, they can be two different types, non-tunneling or an implanted device. Most protocols only allow access during critical events, and they're preserved with heparin. So maybe they have been sick for a long time, they're on long-term antibiotics, they might be at a nursing home or uh, LTAC or something like that, and they've got one of these PICC lines, peripherally inserted central catheter, might be in the upper arm, and it has, you know, looks like an IV coming out of their arm pretty much. You just know that that's connected to a tube that is gone, a catheter that's inside, like, superior vena cava. I mean, it goes all. It can go all the way to there, depending on what kind it is. All right, you can give medications if you have to. They preserve that with heparin. They'll inject that with a few milliliters of heparin to keep it from clotting off. As, and so you might have to pull out the heparin. Use a 10 milliliter syringe to pull out the heparin, and then give whatever medication you want to give. And then we'll just flush it back with saline and let the hospital know, so that way they can pack it with or preserve it with heparin again. Non-tunneling have been inserted by the direct venipuncture and include the PICC line. Midlines inserted, inserted at the antecubital vein. Those are both non-tunneling kinds. So they got it in the shoulder or in the AC there, and then it just looks like a regular uh, catheter coming out pretty much. Might have two or three lumens on it, two or three of those lure lock adapters on there, and that's kind of the dead giveaway that it's going to be a pick line instead, and just know you can do that. Long-term vascular access, the tunneling style, implanted, a lot of times they're up in the shoulder, or 
kind of upper chest and you have to have a special Huber needle to access those and they're underneath the skin you can kind of feel them as like kind of like a little disc underneath the skin so if you got protocols to access those no it takes special equipment people with cancer uh, or very prominent uh, likely to have that that long-term device put in there arterial ventricular fistulas are for dialysis only really so you might ask somebody is this a dialysis fistula or a dialysis access device and if it is even though it might look like a pick line or a regular uh, yeah like a pick line if it's just for dialysis then you still are going to have to start a regular IV your patient will know that if you pick somebody up at a dialysis center chances are it's going to be for just dialysis and you can't use it for anything else there is some nice pictures of somebody accessing that with a Huber needle there so that Huber needle is a lot different style it's got that 90 degree angle on there you want to make sure you keep it nice and clean drugs are absorbed at a speed directly related to the route of delivery drugs injected into the bloodstream are the fastest and oral medications take longer this is a nice table 14-9 kind of shows you how quickly some of those medications are hitting that central bloodstream and circulating throughout the whole body that systemic circulation so IO and IV are the fastest you know 30 to 60 seconds and you're throughout the whole system endotracheal is pretty quick and inhalation that oral route could take 30 to 90 minutes and if you put a topical gel on there nitro paste might be or a fentanyl patch or pain patch or something could take minutes to hours just depends on what it is nitro is quicker but some of those other ones are a long-term thing so that's kind of a cool chart shows you how quickly things are absorbed and ready to go inside the body these are just some specifics you know each medication is different if I was to give fentanyl transdermally so just underneath the skin I'm, I'm sorry transdermally would be the patch over the skin onset could be six to eight hours peak in 12 to 24 hours and it lasts three days in the body whereas if I give that IV onset's immediate peaks within three to five minutes and it's only going to last 20 to 40 minutes in the body intranasally there onset's a little bit slower peaks a little bit slower but it's only going to last in the body 20 to 40 minutes again i am is kind of a nice route there because it has a slower onset a little bit slower peak and a longer duration so it can last a little bit longer so there's a chart for that uh, like i said we're going to be practicing all these ivs look over the book look over the skill drills and watch any other videos uh, the medication dosing and all the drug calculations is going to be a big one there's some other resources that you'll have and practice practice practice